So my name is uh, Patty Hagen, and um, I'm the director of T-Rex. And um, we have this series that we're doing called How I Built It. Um, and I've invited a new friend of mine, Brad Martin, to join us today. Um, he's a successful entrepreneur. He's been working here out of T-Rex. Um, and lately, Brad and I have actually been working on a project with another team of people um, that involve a no, number of different organizations. And we've gotten to know each other a lot more and, um, and just have a lot of respect for Brad and, and what they're doing with their company, with the technology, and um, with um, what, where the future of this kind of technology could go as well. So, um, so Brad, welcome. Thank you for um, doing this today. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Of course, of course. So, um, so Brad, sometimes, you know, we have folks that join us in these calls that are um, thinking about entrepreneurship of, of their own, uh, entrepreneurial activities of their own. Um, so we like to talk about, you know, the journey that you've taken and and the successes and, uh, and challenges that you've encountered, you know, in, in that journey. Um, so why don't we start first though with, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, another reality studio, which is, which is your company. And um, we can, as people join us, we can sort of uh, go over this again, because I hate for people to not understand what your company is, but if you could do a, a short description of what you guys are doing and uh, where you work and yeah, we'll start with that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Brad Martin. I founded Another Reality Studio in um, 2013, 2014. And the goal of the company was to bring emerging technologies to startups and Fortune 100 companies and kind of help them into a new technology, uh, specifically augmented and virtual realities. Um, and just, you know, trying to push forward emerging tech. Uh, so about a year after I started this company, um, my co-founder Mauricio Espin joined me. Uh, he's our CTO at this point, and he kind of brought in uh, more of the technical background as I brought in more of the um, artistic and realistic aspect to the company. And since then, we've been focusing on the emerging techs in uh, a few different industries, um, four of them actually. One of them is architecture, engineering, and construction, so AEC, uh, healthcare, education, and training. Those are our four industries that we uh, focus on the most. So that's what we've been doing. And we currently office out of T-Rex. So that's how uh, Patty and I got uh, introduced and, and are becoming friends, as she mentioned. So it's nice to get to know her and kind of what T-Rex is all about and a great office to office out of. Oh, thanks, Bray. You didn't have to say that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, Brad, can you tell us a little bit about your background? What what drew you to um, this industry, uh, and 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 uh, and what what was your educational background as well? Yeah, so I graduated from the University of Missouri with an architectural design degree. Uh, so I studied interior design and architecture design. Um, and throughout the entire time I was there, I was uh, very very interested in uh, what that that industry would call renderings or animations. Basically, how do you visualize a space um, and what it will look like before the space is built? So I did, um, I had a mentor there, Bamal Balakrishnan. Uh, he was the one who kind of introduced the 3D visualization uh, industry to me, uh, kind of explored some opportunities to receive grants and kind of push the research uh, on that side and kind of what people remember, how they do it. And so that got me very involved in uh, the artistic ability to be able to do what I do now. Um, and so we, we got a couple of grants. We, we uh, created some um, pretty cool rendering and animations. And back then, what were just kind of walkthroughs on the web. Um, and then about 2011 uh, is when virtual reality kind of picked back up and the uh, Oculus had a, a developer kit. And so at that point, um, I picked one up and started kind of uh, teaching myself how to create spaces for that and kind of saw the world of potential, uh, not only with architecture, but with, um, with all industries and just how these technologies can really, really be beneficial for all industries. So uh, shortly after that, I, I did uh, go into the architectural industry. I worked at Gray Design Group here in St. Louis. Uh, and I kind of became their in-house render technician. 
uh, while still, of course, doing the architectural uh, construction documents and design with uh, some of the team there. And then uh, shortly after that, about 2013, 2014 is when I decided that uh, that this was really turning into a company and I needed to, uh, if I was going to do visualizations, animations, things like that, I need to uh, kind of spend my time there. So uh, that is when I uh, kind of went off and, and started my, my own freelancing consulting type company for these items. And it's kind of snowballed since then. Yeah, yeah, it really has. Um, so I want to I want to come back to the moment that you know you made the leap because that moment always is very interesting to me. But prior to that, let, let me ask you about some of your you know you studied architecture, but obviously there's a lot of technology involved in what you're doing now. So it sounds like that was really I mean you self-taught yourself or were, were there um, was that part of the architectural program or a mixture of both? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, there's game engines that are um, were not previously used for architecture and for business applications, but they have scripting languages within their engines that you can kind of teach yourself in how to do some programmatic functions without the need for a specific programming language knowledge or uh, um, being able to do that. So I uh, was already kind of tinkering around with that and kind of teaching myself how to create things for virtual reality, publish things for virtual reality, and then, and then of course, test them. And um, that's kind of when I decided that, um, you know, the stuff that really, if you really want to take a company into uh, bigger and better things, you do need to have somebody who's on the tech side who can really drive those things, of course. Uh, so I was creating more prototypes and things that, of course, they were usable by the client, but it's, you know, limited versions of it. Uh, and that just wasn't my expertise. So that's where I decided to uh, kind of reach out. And Mauricio Espen, uh, when you're in that small of an industry in a field back then, you kind of know everybody. Uh, Mauricio was somebody who was doing some really cool stuff in, in virtual reality. Uh, and so we, I reached out to him and said, hey, I'm pretty busy. I could use some help on these projects. We partnered on a couple and saw that it was a really good fit and, and kind of just brought him on full time. And, and we just kind of ran with it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, so that was when you were already sort of doing your own thing. But let's go back to that the moment yeah. <laughs> when you made the yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, the, the moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so this, yeah. So that was that's more interesting, I suppose, because there were I had already knew that I wanted to get into more of the visualization realm from the architecture realm. So I was starting to apply. Uh, to different architectural visualization companies, but most of them are on the coast. So we had uh, options for, you know, east or west coast. I think I had five or six job offers um, to move full time into that field. They were in uh, LA, Seattle, Portland, New York, and I'm trying to think the other one. Uh, actually, I think there were two in LA. Anyways, uh, they were all on the coast. And so I had worked with a couple of them. We, me and my wife flew out to a, a couple of places and thought about living there, but it just all came back to you're really uprooting your life at this point. We had been in St. Louis a few years. Our families are nearby. Um, we just, our friends, we wanted to kind of stick around here. So I reached out to a couple of them, but at that point in time, nobody was really doing remote work. Um, I did uh, kind of strike a deal with the New York company. It was called Floored. Uh, who since then has been bought out by CBRE. But what they did was online walkthroughs of architecture. And so um, I worked with them as kind of a contractual basis. So it was almost my first client and in, in a way to a kind of opening my eyes to freelancing and consulting. But that was a big jump and it took a, a lot of time because I was essentially sacrificing my steady income, my, uh, you know, everything with, that came with the architecture company with benefits and all. Um, luckily, I have a very supportive wife who, when I, you know, explained to her what I wanted to do was, was all about, hey, now's the time if you want to take risks, now's the time to do it. Uh, so she's actually kind of the one who pushed me into um, doing freelancing, which then kind of led to entrepreneurial uh, things after that when I wasn't uh, necessarily expecting it. That contract with Florida ended about three months later as they pivoted to sell. Uh, so it was sink or swim at that point. And it was, you know, find, find clients or go back to an architecture company. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, I, so I just started working pretty hard on uh, uh, platforms like Upwork. Um, and of course, just word of mouth, other people that I was working with being in the architecture world and just starting to get clients. And I kind of, again, snowballed. So 
Yeah. Well, you know, that's interesting. So what, what you just said and, and uh, connecting with people, what were some of the, looking back now, what were some of those first lessons that you learned when you made that leap and you started freelancing and then, you know, created your own company? What, what were some of the things that you learned to do that were maybe a surprise to you or a challenge or a success, you know, any of those? Yeah. Things? Yeah. I think, I think first of, first off, I had to figure out kind of what was I going to sell. And, and I remember having a lot of trouble figuring out where, uh, how to price it, how to come up with uh, certain proposals for these items and then to get my name out. So that was a big one. Uh, the success that I found was utilizing uh, platforms that are out there, especially Upwork. I still still use Upwork till today. It's just a really good way to have your content somewhere where people who are looking for work, who they, especially when they don't really know what they're looking for, can go there and start to search out and seek advice. Uh, so that was the first thing that I would consider a very big success is getting on a couple of those uh, platforms that work best for what you're wanting to create. Mine being technology with AR, VR, Upwork fit really well with that. Um, not for any particular reason. It's just they had the most AR, VR jobs there. And so I kind of stuck there. Um, I also, also kind of had to, um, you know, throughout the years, what I found success in was really uh, figuring out, uh, you know, you kind of have to go with where the industry is going. So um, that's why when we started as an architectural visualization company, and now we're basically a uh, from concept to completion tech company that builds out um, IP and platforms for, for different companies. So uh, it's pivoted quite a bit since then, though we do still have architectural visualization department, if you will. Um, it's just grown, if anything. So I had to, uh, I think one of the successes was not to narrow our work so much that we couldn't follow where the industry wanted us uh, to be open-minded mm -hmm. to new projects that are coming in, but also to have a pretty clear picture of what your goals are for your business. My, my goal for, for another reality studio was not to blow up and grow and raise funding immediately, uh, which I know is a, a lot of people, uh, what they prefer to do and push out a product. Uh, what I preferred to do was to bootstrap it, grow very slowly and build out our, our base and, and what would kind of sustain a long-term um, a long-term goal instead of a five, 10 year exit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, um, so that's interesting. Did you find that the jobs that you were um, uh, being presented with as an opportunity, so you were looking at jobs, would you, would you, uh, would the jobs sort of also help to form where you thought you would go as a company? Um, or did, were you turning down some jobs too and saying, oh, no, it's not what we do? That must have been sort of hard to do, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. That, the, the very first part of that was trying to figure out which jobs, yeah, which jobs to take and which jobs to kind of let go. Um, I'd say at first, as we kind of figure out where we're going, we're just taking on most items that, that we know we can achieve because, you know, you still have to pay the bills. You still have to do, do that part. So uh, not all of it was, you know, this is my dream. Let's just do everything that, you know, is going to apply to that. Um, and I think most entrepreneurs will tell you that, you know, you have to do where the, you have to go where the money is in order to fund the dreams. Uh, so there was a big portion of that. I'd say at this point, um, it is, you know, most of the projects come to us. We don't reach out as much to others where in the beginning I was reaching out and it was all dependent on the types of jobs that I would seek out and find, um, especially on, on platforms like Upwork. But the great thing about platforms like Upwork is that when you do get a couple of jobs that are successful, that kind of meet where you want to be, more jobs like that flood in and start to reach mm -hmm. out to you because they see the advice. So that was that was a really big thing for us is uh, getting a, a first couple of successful jobs on Upwork really drove kind of our path, which is, uh, of course, like I said, we're taking on other stuff, but we could kind of focus our, our attention towards those. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, Brad. So, um, so Brad, how many employees do you have now? Uh, Full-time employees, we have five. And then 1099 contractors, we have about 12. Um, mm -hmm. And our, our method of growth is that we uh, bring on 1099 contractors as, as a part-time, uh, kind of test them out, test us out, uh, make sure it's a good mm -hmm. fit, make sure that the projects are are uh, meeting in the budget, meeting in the time. And then 
uh, most of our people that we're working with, um, clients that we're working with, we're always trying to, of course, make them long-term or partnerships. And so if they do become a long-term or partnership client, we can take those uh, part-time uh, 1099 contractors, turn them into a full-time team uh, for that partner. And then it's we kind of are a little different than normal companies because we kind of let you choose if you want to be a full-time employee or a 1099 contractor because we understand there are pros and cons to both. Some people don't need health insurance and they just want to do their contracting thing. Other people require some benefits. And so we have that option too, but um, a little against the grain. We have people write their own job descriptions and give them to us instead of vice versa, because we understand that uh, you know, you're know you bringing something to us and we want to know what that is instead of us saying, this is what we want, fill it. Uh, so we, we do things a little bit differently. Um, but that's, that's how we grow our team and kind of uh, you know, we keep, we stay thin. We don't, we don't blow up too much. We just bring on the needs when, um, and kind of meet the needs of the employees and the contractors before we uh, blow up too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love, I, I'd never heard of writing your own job description. <laughs> I mean, behind the scenes that happens a lot, right? But, <laughs> um, that's a great method. Um, so I know you and I've talked a little bit about this, but, um, you have a, a model in which, um, your employees are also, also are distributed um, in various places. So can you talk a little bit about how you manage that um, kind of a, a team? Yeah, I think uh, people are probably starting to figure out how to do that a lot more now with uh, with the pandemic and with this past year, a lot of uh, third parties kind of coming, especially Zoom. I mean, here we are now on Zoom uh, going yeah. through this. So there's lots of ways to connect. Uh, we've been doing remote work since the beginning. So since 20, you know, 2013, 2014, we've been working fully as a fully remote company. Uh, we do have some people uh, here in St. Louis with us that um, that office out of T-Rex with us. And that's always an option for any of our developers. Um, because some people prefer to come in and work as a team. Uh, but the way that we achieve a successful remote business model is um, by having the experience of doing it for the past seven years. Uh, a lot of it comes with knowing uh, how to have your project management structured. So we use a lot of tools like Trello and Jira and Toggle for time reports. And um, we've kind of set that up since the beginning. So people know uh, that Mauricio is is going to, uh, you know, create the JIRA schedule for the developers and then developers are going to pull their tasks and we're going to have that kind of offline communication in that way, which a lot of tech companies do. Uh, however, we don't necessarily have office hours where everybody's on at once. Uh, we care a lot more about deadlines being hit than we do about uh, how often they work or what times they work. Uh, but then, of course, in, in certain projects where it's essential that we have standups or meetings every week to kind of catch up, we just schedule those um, per project. So um, we'll schedule once a week or twice a week um, with the team per project. And um, for, for our type of work, it seems to go pretty well. We do sometimes meet in virtual reality, too, uh, whenever we yeah. feel like we need to uh, kind of get through things a little bit more uh, efficiently. So there's a lot of different tools out there now that are kind of helping uh, these types of models that are fully remote and people who aren't coming into the office. You know, Brad, that, um, it makes me wonder how much time do you have to spend now just, uh, is that your organizational um, effort or do you have someone that helps you with that or is it sort of distributed? Yeah, well, I, I actually am not a very structured person at all. So it works very well with my mentality because I will jump on, you know, calls at 2 a.m. with clients who are overseas or, you know, I don't have a very fixed schedule. Um, Michael, he's our COO, Chief Operation Officer. He, we've, uh, he's come on uh, recently and he's helped bring a lot of that structure uh, for people who are more structured and can kind of find, find a path that way. But I'd say that um, between Michael, Mauricio and myself, uh, we all, all kind of handle portions of that. Uh, so Mauricio handles a lot of the organizational stuff, which has to do with uh, our consultants and our full-time employees knowing what they should be working on, when they should be working on, what the deadlines are. So he brings a lot of that structure there, uh, where my structure is more client-based. Um, and I kind of establish those standups with the clients and kind of um, the proposaling process, the design document process, all of that kind of structure goes through 
uh, through me and the clients. And then Michael, of course, brings on the whole standards of the company of what we should be doing or where we could be more efficient. Yeah, that makes sense. So we, let's go back to the technology because that, that's also really cool. <laughs> You're doing some really cool stuff. So why don't, um, for folks that might not be familiar, um, can you do a, an explanation of um, uh, extended reality technologies and the kind of technologies you're working in? Yeah, absolutely. So we have uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, and then a third one called mixed reality. I'll explain those real quick so that people understand what I'm talking about. But uh, actually, and I'll, I'll give some visuals. Why not? We're here. Yeah, um, good. So we love visuals. visuals. Uh, so <laughs> virtual reality would take place in a headset meaning that you're fully immersing the user into a virtual environment. So something like this is called the Oculus Quest. Uh, so this would be, you know, me being the user would put this on and I would be fully immersed into a virtual uh, space and it could look like an animation or it could look like the real world. It's all dependent on what the goals are of the client. Uh, this is what we use a lot for training. Uh, so people can kind of do muscle memory and tasks that, um, maybe are usually dangerous in the real world. They can do it in here now without the risk of, of actually losing limbs or, or falling from high places. Uh, though it, that is pretty uh, alarming still in virtual reality. It feels very immersive. So if you're falling, you'll feel it. Um, so that's virtual reality. Augmented reality takes place more uh, on mobile devices like your cell phone or an iPad. And what augmented reality is, is you use the camera of the device. And so you still see the real world through the camera of the device but you also see augmented elements of virtual items within the real world. So one of the examples that we've did for um, uh, a large furniture company was to be able to take their library and their inventory and be able to uh, show it uh, to the user within their house. So if somebody was redecorating their living room or their office, they could pull up their phone, they could go through the library of desks and chairs, place them in their, in their, uh, living room on their phone and see what it would actually look like from a design perspective. So we use that a lot for architecture and for design or, or the fit of items. Um, so that's kind of the technology behind augmented and virtual reality. Mixed reality is the last one. It's slightly different. A lot of people um, call it mixed reality whenever you have something like these types of glasses where you can see the real world, but you can almost have a slider effect of is it fully virtual or is it augmented? Um, so it's kind of a mixed portion. Also, it's a way to interact with uh, the real world items through your glasses as well. So collecting data of the real world and seeing a, a something you know on your glasses that kind of explain what that is. So um, those are kind of the three technologies that we're we're mostly in. Mm -hmm. um, what what are some of the give, give us some examples of companies? I, I, you've shown me some examples and they're fascinating. Can you explain some of the uh, uh, sort of industries that you're working with and, and how you're working with them or what you're providing them? Uh, yes. So uh, I'll start with the architectural one. I think it's probably one of the easiest ones to understand verbally since there's no uh, way to kind of show yeah, it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but for architecture, it's very challenging for uh, clients and the designers to be on the same page. So uh, a lot of times architects have this idea of what it'll look like and they can visualize it in their mind's eye, but the client kind of just looks at these 2D plans and they're like, well, I'll trust you. I hope it looks great. Uh, where, where we fill this gap is we've built a platform called Looking Glass and what it allows architects to do is submit their, their plans and um, we'll create a model that is then web-based. So it's fully online. And the client can also get online and they can see the 2D plans that they typically see in the same location, or they can hit um, 360, which for us just means entering into a 3D environment. Then they can use their uh, arrow keys and mouse to virtually walk through the space. So they'll be able to see a realistic representation of the 2D plans, and they'll be able to see what it looks like, which will help them to be more decisive on materials, uh, sight lines, the way the sun come through, so comes through the window, uh, where they want specific offices or furniture. Um, so it gives, it gives a vision to, um, to what the design is that the architects have. Now, of course, we have companion apps that are more of the augmented and virtual reality that I was talking about. So that same exact scene can be viewed in virtual reality, which then brings the whole uh, experience into real scale as well. 
uh, or augmented reality where they can actually be on the site of the new building and viewing where that's where that building will be on the site and kind of physically walking and seeing it as they move through it. So there's really cool applications to uh, to these industries. Um, one of the things that I've also found fascinating is I know you've worked with um, companies um, creating training applications where um, I know you mentioned earlier if there's a dangerous um, uh, potential for danger in um, training someone that using um, uh, virtual reality can be a really good way of you know, getting rid of the danger, um, but training someone in a very realistic environment at the same time. You showed me uh, a training, uh, a virtual reality training. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm, it's not a film. What do we call it? It's not a video. Yeah, it's Experience, a, it's a right? yeah, it's, or, mm -hmm, yeah. Right? Okay. Uh, a, a virtual rea reality training experience, in which, uh, uh, People who are working on um, oil um, oil refineries out in the ocean could be trained in case of an explosion, right? Things like that. Yeah, that's right. I think that that's one of our like coolest experiences. I think because yeah, you put on this headset and you're automatically like in the middle of the ocean on an oil rig. Uh, which you, uh, not many people have probably done before, but you actually feel the sensation of being there. You see all of the same things you would as you were there. And then you have controllers that kind of look like this, um, which now give you the opportunity to kind of interact with the space. So these are kind of your virtual hands. Uh, and we programmed in different functions for climbing up ladders. So they kind of just click on this this button here and they grab and pull themselves up and that will that will move them up along with some other things. But it gave, it gave them a way to, uh, train in a safe way on what happens if they drill too deep and the drill has a uh, basically a, a explosion from uh, the mechanics not getting through there. So uh, you also learn a ton about different industries while you're building stuff out. Like I never knew anything about oil rigs. Now I know a lot. But anyway, so whenever you would drill too deep, we would simulate that explosion and we'd you know shake your head and we'd, you'd see the fire. But then instead of um, you know, obviously that would be dangerous in the real world, but instead of that, now we show these little direct paths and this is a, a based on an actual oil rig. So the path should all be the same. Um, but we show these arrows, these green arrows that show you, how do you get from the drill site all the way down to the escape boat pods? And so we kind of direct the different paths of where that user was and show them how to get there. And then once they get there, the simulation's done. And, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, it saves lives because people don't, you know, a freak out in that situation or do anything that they, uh, you know, they're trained and they know follow the path and go down to the escape pods, get in there. Of course, they're trained in the real world as well, but this helps to bring things into a more immersive, like you actually feel what you would feel if that were actually happening. Right. There's so many implications of um, these kinds of technologies um, for education as well. We've um, here at T-Rex um, recently, we saw an example of a virtual reality training session um, focused on um, building um, um, an automobile and uh, and building the engine of an automobile, and you know you you're actually well you're not actually but you're handling the you know the various components and putting them into the proper sequence and um, proper assembly, and it's a great way to train people and especially during a pandemic, right? Um, so are you seeing um, movement in education along those lines as well? Yes, we are doing a lot in education. We partner with a company called Disrupt Ed, um, and they work in early childhood ages from uh, preschool up to like 13. And, and basically we're trying to bring uh, not only education to home as it is coming here, uh, but also just a fun and excitement to learning. Uh, so we do a couple of augmented reality books. They have, they can purchase a kit. They can use AR for books and bring the books to life, um, teach them how to read, teach them the meanings of words, teach them math, all of these things. I think also on the, um, you know, when we're talking about how the pandemic's kind of shifted the way this works, we also were able to do, um, it's education, but it's also in the art art world. So uh, in San Diego, there was a art institute that had to close the doors and uh, they had in-house residents that were supposed to have shows and things like that. And so uh, we actually 
uh, partner together and create an augmented reality app so people can uh, view the artist's work from their home. You know, they can pull the actual artwork into their home. They can walk around it. They can look at different views of it and it looks very realistic. And then we also built a one-to-one -one model of the Art Institute gallery. So people, if they're outside or in a park can, you know, tap and they'll actually see the Art Institute come up in front of them and they can physically walk through the gallery as if they were there see the artwork um, and even more so we wanted to kind of give a picture of what her inspiration was in creating these sculptures and so we actually have water filling up the gallery um, as you go because the inspiration was ancient ruins and so we have water filling up the gallery and by the time the water is above your head you can see you know all these ancient we kind of turned the gallery into an ancient ruins gallery and, and it really does work very well with the art and you kind of get a different view of what uh, Cammy was going for when she was doing these sculptures. So it's, it's just really cool to be able to help companies who uh, wouldn't have been able to do this without the technology and their doors would have been closed. Uh, instead of doing that, bringing an ability for people to still see the artwork, still explore the gallery. Um, and same with education, bringing education to people instead of just getting on Zoom all day for kids and kind of running through classrooms. Now they're able to you know, have fun with some of the kits and still be able to learn, but enjoy what they're doing and be more engaged. Cause I think that's something we're going to have to work on. If, if this sticks around a little bit is how do you keep people engaged in these types of virtual environments uh, without getting zoom fatigue as I've heard it called or, or these other items. So. Yeah. You know, um, another thing you've shown us is um, you set up a convention um, uh, where people could actually enter it. They had avatars and, um, and their avatars were actually interacting with one another in a, in a conference or convention. Um, th these things to me seem like there's so much promise into the future for education and um, connection um, to other people in other countries and so forth. Really all these boundaries kind of melt away in, in, in the little bit that, that I've been able to experience both with, with what you've shown us and and some others, um, it, it just really blows your mind what the possibilities could be. What do you think are some of the, um, uh, the next steps? Are it, what is your vision for the future of these kinds of technologies and, and where we might um, see them headed? Yeah, I, yeah, to mention the, the virtual event portion is inter interesting because we kind of got lucky on that. We were developing something along those lines and then uh, when this pandemic hit, it became a lot more uh, needed. Uh, so you can kind of see where technology can fill these gaps, but now it's a you know it's needed. It's a requirement. So we hosted a 1,000 person conference uh, for people who usually travel to Hawaii for the conference. Now we're you know based all over the world, and they were able to join and still. Uh, be able to walk around the virtual environment and have those portions that you typically miss in a Zoom conference because you can still have networking, you can still have vendor booths, you can walk into a booth, talk to somebody, learn about their product, fill out a lead form, purchase the product. Or as you're walking across the boardwalk, you can just click on one of the avatars and have a conversation with the real person that's at the event. So uh, it was very cool. I think that uh, the technology in general is becoming more and more uh, possible. We have things like 5G, uh, we have things like these new standalone headsets like I'm showing you. Uh, there's Microsoft uh, headsets called the HoloLens. Uh, Apple is supposedly coming out with glasses. Unreal is coming out with glasses. Uh, Vuesix has glasses. So there's a lot of wearables that will eventually become more and more common like the Apple Watch or like the iPhone, all these things uh, that will allow us to incorporate AR and VR in a more day-to-day -day fashion. Um, and I think a lot of this, yeah, a lot of those technologies, I think it's hard to, you know, predict what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years, but I think it'll, um, I think we'll have a very uh, possible merge of the virtual world and the real world where you can host an event in a real place, but still have a virtual element to it and still, you know, meet people virtually or meet people in real life and a lot of that comes with some of these new technologies like 5G and wearable glasses that have higher capabilities. Yeah. Is there anything that you worry about with regard to this technology? Well, I mean, anything can be used for good or for bad. I think it's very important that we, um, you know, as you're developing, you're, you're taking into consideration security and privacy. Absolutely. 
Um, I think most of the technology that I'm foreseeing in the near future with, with AR and VR will be pretty optional. I mean, there's nothing that, you know, people won't be uh, made to do anything or um, it won't be required for people to participate. It's more of an additional option or something that can bring a more exciting and immersive experience alongside of it. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think uh, it's very important to, to guard personal information, to make sure that people feel comfortable in the equipment that, that they're not going to, you know, with VR, you're, you're kind of, you're fully excluded from, <laughs> you know, there's no way to see through it. You have a couple cameras, so you can, but uh, when you're actually in an experience, you don't see the outside world. And so um, it's, you have to, you, you're pretty vulnerable. You know, you, you got people yeah. around you and you might not know what you look like. You know, some people, <laughs> some people get concerned about how they look and they look funny. So um, yeah. there's things like that, that we try to, that these types of solutions will help like glasses, like what I'm wearing that still allow that interface. Uh, those kinds of things will help as we can integrate it into a more common thing, uh, give you more social awareness while you're in these experiences. And then of course, still protecting protecting personal information and security is always important. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go back to entrepreneurship just for a minute before we run out of time, because we're gonna, um, I, we have some, some folks here um, in the session and I wanna give anybody a chance to ask questions um, uh, before we run out of time. But uh, what kind of advice would you have for someone who uh, wants to uh, start up their own company or, or start to freelance, what would be some things that you've learned that you'd like to pass on to others to be successful? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just starting. I think that's the hardest part is like, I don't, not everybody has to, like, I think you mentioned like that moment where you just jump off and you just do it. Uh, that was very gradual for me. I didn't just decide one day, like, hey, I'm quitting my job and starting this thing up. Uh, it was very gradual. I was pulling in more and more side projects and what moonlighting, freelance, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was doing all these things on the side that was uh, able to kind of turn into something sustainable uh, and then eventually successful uh, for me and for people that work with me. Um, so it's definitely, you know, if you're, it can be a slow process that you, that you can kind of pull things in as you want. But I think the biggest thing is if you really have something that you want to be doing that is freelancing or consulting, uh, just start it. Just start to uh, do things, build up a portfolio or whatever it is in, in your industry that's going to show people that you can do this for them and then get on platforms like uh, Upwork or, or some of the other ones where you can reach out to people and kind of start those jobs and, and you'll learn a lot of things. You'll uh, you'll do a lot of great things for a lot of great people uh, and you'll gain relationships. So that's how you're going to merge slowly from uh, what you're doing now to what you want to do as an entrepreneur. Um, that's, that's what worked for me. I'm not saying that's the only way. Of course, if you want to just dive right in, go get funding and you have a good idea, more power to you. Uh, and any way that, uh, that I can help or Patty can help, I'm sure she would want to too. So. Yeah, I think um, I've always thought and I've always noticed in um, our, more, our more successful entrepreneurs that, that there's this very insatiable uh, curiosity um, this desire to keep learning and, and, and keep getting engaged in new things and, um, and an excitement about that. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that there is a specific uh, type of person. I don't know um, that, that just can't not be an entrepreneur. Like I've, I've, uh, I stumbled into this, but it's because of, just the way that I am. I just wanted to do these things. And so it's the way that it happened. But I think that if you have that similar spirit and that similar drive, um, then you, you're you only holding yourself back if you don't start or you don't give yourself the opportunity. Because I think a lot of that, uh, Patty and I were talking before this, um, there's so much potential and opportunity out there. It's not um, I think it is scary. Of course, it's scary to, uh, I mean, there's lots of different fears from being rejected to not making enough of uh, money to support yourself to, you know, list goes on. Um, but I think until you kind of start and take that leap, it'll always be that itch. Um, and so just the sooner, the better. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're, you're, you can't avoid it. You have to, yeah. you have to keep going. You have to chase it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, does anybody in our group have any questions um, that they would like to ask Brad? You can put them in chat or you can 
I don't it looks like everybody is on um, mute. So we would have to uh, let you off mute if you wanted to ask. Okay, I don't see anybody. <laughs> also, I think, you know, um, I know at least in, in um, my life, and you mentioned this too, um, Brad, that, you know, having that support system around you, um, the kinds of startups that I've been involved with personally have been nonprofit kinds of startups. Um, but there's, there is some similarity to that as well. And I've always, my husband has always been incredibly supportive of me, you know, leaving a, a good job with benefits and, <laughs> and going to your thing, you know, and, and uh, giving it a try because, you know, it's, um, he, he always knew that that could maybe make me happy. So, um, and it has always worked out. So, but, but you make it work out as well. So, uh, oh, here's a question. Okay, so Chris Gatewood, how do you handle communication across industries? Has it been difficult to find a common language across disciplinary boundaries? And do you have any tips for that? That's a really good question. Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. So, um, yes, I think that uh, it is very difficult to understand and find a common language when you're when you're dealing with industries that um, you know you haven't been involved with for a long time. Which for me, I, I experience that very often, especially our consultancy portion of ARS. Is I'm always getting requests. Uh, the the one recently has been fashion. Like, how do we bring this technology to fashion? And we do have a couple of fashion clients now that we're working with and and trying to do that. Um, but yeah, I don't know the language at all. Like I'll say, and I'll, I think the biggest thing is, is one to just have a very open and eagerness to learn. Like we were just talking about, like, I'm excited to learn anything that my clients bring me because uh, I know we can use this technology for it. So it's kind of like a puzzle for me. It's like, how do we make this work? So in order to know that I have to, I have to do my research and learn the industry. And so that's my biggest tip is like, do your due diligence, figure out the language that people are using, talk with other people who are in the, in the industry and kind of figure out what those are. Number two tip though, is just be open and honest that you've never worked. I mean, I think a lot of times as an entrepreneur, you're scared you're going to lose that job or you're not going to, uh, you know, you're going to underquote the job or you're going to overquote the job. There's just a lot of fears that go in outside of the actual project. But I think being open and honest has been uh, the way that I've built trust with my clients and therefore retained clients long term or, or even became partners with them. Um, and so that was the biggest thing for me is I, I upfront said, hey, we've never done fashion. I'm very interested. Tell me more about fashion. Let's learn how we can do this. Um, and I think they understand that my expertise is technology, AR, VR. Their expertise is fashion. So they expect questions. And I think that's one thing is um, it's okay that communication can be awkward at times and, and can be misunderstood at times as long as you just redundantly almost explain what you're saying uh, and they're on the same page that you're all kind of learning it together. Yeah, yeah. That communication piece is huge. And that was a great question that Chris asked. But watching you communicate, Brad, across a variety of different audiences, um, it's very clear that um, you are a very open person and very honest about um, uh, what you do and, and, and what you know. And I think people really appreciate that. So, so that's awesome. Um, we got another question here um, from Stephanie. She said, what do you think of NFTs in your industry? Uh, yeah, so NFTs are interesting because they've just recently taken this like huge jump into like a potential thing, especially with all the blockchain things that's been happening from currency to uh, data. So it's definitely something that uh, works very well with our industry. Pretty much anything, you know, tech is going to work well with this, especially the art side. Art side is kind of the big NFT thing right now. Um, and so yeah, I mean, I, aside from, I think it'll stick around. I think it's probably, you know, I have a lot of learning. If we're talking about being open and honest about that, I have a ton of learning to do about NFTs. Uh, I know very little compared to um, probably what most experts in the field know, but I do know that uh, for our art world uh, people, it's a, it's a big deal right now. And we're starting to kind of incorporate that blockchain and be able to offer uh, those types of options. Uh, we're doing a VR art gallery 
who were tying NFTs to all of the work, of course, um, and then allowing people to come through and purchase and, and some, something a little bit more decentralized. So it's a, it's a really cool technology. And I think it'll, it's a, it's around to stay. I, I'd say, I, I just think that they have to kind of find their uh, best use purpose. Yeah. Yeah. As an aside, I, I have to note this because um, we're, we're working on, we're very interested in emerging technologies here at, at T-Rex, as you know. And um, so we've just um, put up for auction, um, just as sort of a, a learning, a push the boundaries kind of a thing, and also a fundraising thing as a nonprofit. Um, the, we believe it's the first geospatial NFT. So, um, so it's up there and you can buy the, um, uh, you, you have to check it out. It's on open seas um, and um, it's, it's uh, focused on T-Rex. And so um, maybe somebody with a great geospatial, uh, a great geospatial collector might want to uh, buy that um, NFT and help support T-Rex. So sorry, got to, had to put that in, but really that was, it's, it's to test the boundaries of it all, right? It's to, try to figure out what, what is this thing? Where does it go? What, what does it mean to people? Um, how, how do we use it best? Um, the art piece of it makes total sense to me. And I think it could really be an interesting um, um, an important new way to experience art that hasn't um, existed before, obviously. So um, art becomes alive and um, and so in, in your industry, Brad, I could see a whole bunch of really interesting things happening uh, there. So I think we have another question here. Um, so I think, I think but what Bobby is asking here is it's advice for his own company, I, I'm assuming, because I, I don't think he's asking you to do things for free, Brad, but he says, if you have an idea for the entertainment industry, would you know he's asking for your advice would you offer that service for free in order to build your reputation and get advertisers to pay to be on your platform or would you build it for clients as a plug-in to their existing system so more of a sort of a strategy question yeah yeah and then also just noticing i think we missed grant's question so we'll cycle back up oh, to it but sorry. uh yeah, oh, no worries back to yeah. That. sorry grant yeah but bobby um yeah, so I think that both uh, both methods have their warrant. Again, I think it's more of a balance and trying to decide what you're willing to do and what you're willing to uh, retain or give away is a big portion of this. Me personally, uh, I have not ever offered services for free in order to build my reputation. Um, I, I think uh, even in the beginning, I knew that there was a worth to what I was doing. Uh, trying to figure out what that worth was was difficult. Uh, but I think, you know, trial and error was a better path for me than for offering free services. But that's not to say offering free services is not a good route. I just uh, preferred it the other way because I did see it as something that I wanted to jump into uh, full time uh, quicker. Um, and then the other one was, oh, yeah. And then paying average. So, so this is a different story. If you're talking about building your own platform or attaining the IP uh, you know, uh, providing a subscription service of something that people will jump onto. Uh, we have done that. We use our internal uh, funding and investment to reinvest into our company and, and build up these platforms. And of course, there's no client fronting that bill. That's that's us. Uh, so in that regard, yes, um, we would do that. And I think that there's definitely ways to offer discounted services to get people on there in a beta, uh, alpha or beta, or some sort of way to get people uh, kind of prove out the concept, see what they're what they're willing to use it for. Uh, it's definitely a good strategy. Um, I think that we've also done the opposite. In your second question, we have built um, projects for clients that we've told them up front. It's like, hey, I know your budget's here. Um, I can still build this, but we get to retain the IP or or the the plugin version, so we can continually use it for other people. Of course, there's still non-competes and NDAs out there uh, to protect both parties. But the idea is that if uh, their goal is not necessarily to run the platform themselves, they just need this plugin. We've definitely um, provided services as a discount to to keep the plugin um, and uh, give them a perpetual license for their existing system. So I think it's a it's a tough. I, I'd love to talk with you if you have. Uh, if you want to talk about the entertainment industry, it's not the industry I'm in. Um, you know, we've done a little bit of games and, and animations for 
parties that are in the in entertainment industry, but it's not the main industry I'm in, but I'm, I'm glad to think through a business strategy with you and try and think of how you could uh, address it. Wow, that's really nice. That's nice, Brad. Um, and we have this question from Grant. Sorry, I missed this earlier. Uh, Grant, from a producer standpoint, how would you recommend starting a mixed reality focused company? Yeah, and then I think he reposted it. it says, I lack the technological yeah. skills for my project with the long term vision for an early education and higher education through VR, Michelle. Okay. Um, so, again, this is, is very broad. It's hard for me to give like specific advice about a particular company without knowing exactly what you plan on doing. Um, but I, I lacked a lot, a lot of technological skills for my vision whenever I first started. And I think there's a saying that says, you know, you can go uh, fast by yourself or you can go far with others. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that was something that was big for me as I realized, you know, I, even though I want control uh, over what products going out there, I can't do everything myself because I'm a bottleneck. I'm limiting myself. Um, and I was getting busy. And so at that point I reached out uh, Mauricio who filled that second, you know, skill set that I didn't, didn't fill was able to fill that. So, um, if I could duplicate Mauricio and send him over, I would. He's a he's a uh, amazing guy. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing is trying to find somebody who does have those uh, tech skills uh, who can uh, kind of come alongside you and, and and partner up to do these early education and higher education. Um, also, if you want, we do do education VR and, and MR and AR. So if you have questions specifically regarding that, I'll be able to answer those. Uh, quite a bit. Um, so anything that I can do to kind of help you get started, I do, I'd say what we talked about earlier is just get started, find uh, some project that you're interested in and, and can, if you can get funding for it even better, but just start and see what you can do on your own. I think you'd be surprised with how much information's out there to learn some of this stuff yourself as well. Hmm. Um, and Chris asked another question, what should a filmmaker interested in VR know before entering the field? strategies or resources for a self-study crash course? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Filmmaking in VR. So there's really cool, I don't know if you've seen like volumetric videos or um, some of the like uh, methods around uh, doing photogrammetry and, and 360 mm -hmm. video and volumetric videos, but there's some really cool information out there. So if you're a filmmaker interested in VR, I'd say that's going to be a pretty a pretty big uh, portion of your uh, self-taught uh, study courses. There's also a, a tons you can do with animation. I don't know if you're talking about filmmaking specifically of real life videography, but there's also animation that can, um, you know, like Avatar, for instance, you can create some animations that are really cool and you can get into some of the VR animation. So uh, as far as like strategies, resources, um, crash courses, I know... Um, Unreal Engine has, that's the uh, platform. Well, we use Unreal Engine and Unity at ARS. Uh, Unreal Engine's typically what we use for virtual reality. Um, it's an it's amazing uh, program and you have, they have tons of courses built in uh, that can help with some of their uh, VR and filmmaking and animation. Also, um, I can't remember, Mauricio would be a better person to ask this. So maybe I should just post my contact information to the any uh, everyone tab here. Uh, anybody who has questions can also follow up with me via email, uh, but I would be happy to send out um, some courses there too. Uh, let's see. So I'm just, I'll post maybe my you need email. To make a, you need to make a virtual reality Maurizio and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we can we host them Share on a server. Them around. And we can just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Um Brad, it uh we're doing some cool work together with uh Amzol right now and uh, uh some Northside community members. Um what are some things that um just as sort of some closing comments, what are some things that you see um from doing this community work with us? Um we're basically just to just to let um, our friends on this call know this is to sort of introduce these technologies um, to folks in several north side communities, North County uh, communities, the 241 community, if, if you're familiar with with that um, name. Um, 
so that they understand what could be used to help them in their governance and administration of their um, of these various communities across the north side. So it's been a really interesting conversation. What are some things um, that have struck you about that, Brad? Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, one of the most important reasons I got into you know doing my own. Uh, company and kind of being able to choose where we work on is being having the opportunity to invest time and projects into things that really matter. Um, you know, and I think it was immediately evident that whenever we all met and talked about the 24 one footprint, um, that there are uh, things that technology can solve and bring light to, uh, to help uh, building planning efficiency uh, data uh, simulations, all of these things that can really help uh, St. Louis City and the 24-1 uh, footprint. So uh, yeah, it's been very exciting. I think one of the things that we probably should should have said before, or I should have said before and I didn't, is uh, when you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur and kind of pushing out for your own thing, uh, I wouldn't try to like change your expertise. Like you are who you are, your personality, you know, just go with what you're really good at and really just push that out. Because I think, you know, I, I tried, <laughs> this is a stupid example, but I tried to kind of adapt and wake up at 7.30 uh, and then go to bed at 10. That is not who I am. I am a night person. I like to stay up until 2 a.m. I like to wake up at nine. Like that is my schedule. And every time I try to adapt it, it would work for a couple of weeks and then slowly merge back because I didn't I didn't, I tried to change myself instead of just doing what I really liked. So although that's a dumb example, it's something that you should, you should consider when you're pushing out in your own field, because there may be money in a certain thing. Um, but that's not going to be something that you're really going to find fulfillment. And um, not that you'll find fulfillment in a job, but we all got to work. So may as well be something that we're good at and enjoy. <laughs> um, but this is, this is, this is exactly my thoughts on, on this project, Patty is uh, this 24 one footprint is something that not only do I think is cool, but it really strikes with, with, you know, everybody coming together and, and doing things together and not worrying about all these different statuses or, or money, but just building something that is helpful to a community and to a people. And so that's been really, really cool to, to do. Wow. Well, we've loved having you working with us, Brad. It's been just such a pleasure to get to know you. And um, I, I just, we just love to have you around and we look forward to working with you into the future. So um, with that guys, I think we're about at the end of our talk today and we just want to thank you for joining us again, Brad. That was awesome. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity and it was great to hear from all of you and, and see you all. So thank you.